Good evening and welcome to the Revelation of Jesus Christ. Very happy to welcome each of you here. To those of you that are joining us by television or by radio or on the internet, we're very happy to welcome you tonight. This is a study of the book of Revelation chapter by chapter. And therefore, I would like to encourage you to uh, get your Bible. And if you're at home, go get your Bible. Those of you that are here in the auditorium, I'll encourage you to bring your Bibles. And uh, be nice if you brought along a highlighter and a notepad, because we're going to study the book of Revelation, take a look at it. So we hope that all of you will do that as we study God's Word together. Uh, this first session that uh, we're doing is made up of eight presentations. Those eight presentations are going to be on the seven churches of Asia Minor. That's what they're going to be about. And we will be covering uh, the first three chapters of Revelation. That's what we're going to be looking at as we go through this first section. So uh, be sure bring your Bible. Our next presentation that we'll be doing tomorrow night is entitled Seven Churches of Revelation, and we're going to look at particularly the church of Ephesus. Of the seven churches, this was probably the best one, but it lost its love. And we're going to take a look at what the Scripture tells us about the church of Ephesus, and so we hope you will be able to follow along as we take a look at that. Uh, since the book of Revelation is a revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, what does it tell us about Jesus Christ? That's what we're going to be looking at. And that is our subject tonight. It's entitled, It's Who You Know. It's Who You Know. And that makes all the difference in the world, is who you know. And so we're going to start right out talking about Jesus, what the book of Revelation has to say, about Jesus Christ. For those of you who are watching, uh, this is the altar of incense that was in the sanctuary of old. Uh, it is exact size of the altar of incense that would have been in the uh, sanctuary they built, and it was overlaid with gold. Uh, this one's not. It's overlaid with paint, but... Uh, <laughs> but uh, that's what it was, and uh, we're going to use it as a podium because we think it fits into the subject as we go through it, and, and you will see that as we study it. Uh, each night, as we go into the presentation, we're going to read to you all the Scripture that we're going to be looking at that evening. Uh, we'll do that each night, and you can either read it on the screen, or you can uh, follow in your Bible. We, we don't care which, but that's what, what we will do each evening. Anytime I can have uh, Joe Pearls come and sing for me, I'm always blessed. Uh, Joe has been singing with us for about, oh, 13, 14 years now. He li lives in Greenbrier, Tennessee, which is a, on the outskirts of Nashville, and it's always a special blessing to have Joe with us. Also, uh, we're going to have Chuck Algar, who's one of our team members. Uh, he's worked with us for 10, 11 years. He's the one that's going to read the Scripture to you each evening and go through that with you. So we hope you'll follow along as we read the Scripture. And so I'm hoping that as we study the book of Revelation, that it will bless you. In a, in a special way. So, Chuck, come and share the Word of God with us. If you have your Bibles, turn them to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 20. Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 20. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent it and signified it by his angel 
to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads, and those who hear the words of this prophecy, and keep the things which are written in it, for the time is near. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book, and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white, like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like the flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. His countenance was like the sun, shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. May God add his blessing to the study of his word tonight. I'm not on an ego trip I'm nothing on my own I make mistakes and often slip Just common flesh and bone But I'll prove someday just why I say I'm of a special kind when he was on the cross I was on his mind A look of love was on his face The thorns 
upon his head the blood was on that scarlet robe and stained it crimson red though his eyes were on the crowd that day he looked ahead in time when he was on the cross I was on his mind he As we open the book of Revelation, we pray, Lord, that it may be a revealing to each of us. We ask that our hearts may be open, soft, tender, that the voice of your Spirit may speak to each one of us, and that we might see and understand what you have written that we might prepare our lives to walk with you and to be with you in your kingdom for the marvelous promises of your word. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Well, the book of Revelation was not written for the world. It was written for the church, not for the world. And... Uh, what is recorded in the book of Revelation is probably the most important book of all the books in the Bible to the people that are living today. If, if you didn't have any other book for this day and this age, you need the book of Revelation because it tells about the pearls and the trials, tribulation, that the people of God are going to go through. It also talks about your triumphs and your joys that you find in your walk with the Lord. So that's the reason we're looking at it. So I'd like to encourage you, take your Bible, open it up to Revelation, the first chapter, because that's where we're going to begin with, and that's what we're going to take a look at now as we study the book of Revelation and what it has to say. And we took a look, and it says this, and the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place, and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. This is the order that it comes in. It says that God took it and gave it to Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ gave it to the angel. This is probably the same angel that you find in the book of Daniel when God sent messages to them concerning the last days, the angel Gabriel. And so he's probably the one here that's taking this to John 
And it says that then John took it and gave it to the seven churches. That's the order that it's given. So when you're reading it, you understand. And it says that it is a revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what it is. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. How much of it is a revelation of Jesus Christ? The name Jesus or names for Jesus, or pronouns referring to him, there are a hundred, it's a hundred and forty times in the first three chapters. So indeed, when it says it is a revelation of Jesus Christ, it is that, no question about it. Blessed is he who reads, and who, those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is at hand. Now, folks, it's making it very clear that God has placed a special blessing on the people that read the book of Revelation, hear it, and keep those things that are written in it. So it's very, very important that you and I do not take the book and set it on a shelf somewhere and not read it. Even, folks, even if you have a hard time understanding the book of Revelation, I will assure you that if you'll just keep at it, it will open up and you will understand. So the Scripture says, blessed is that person who reads. What does read mean? When it says, blessed is he who reads. Well, that word read actually means search. Look into it. See what it has to say. It doesn't mean that you and I just give it a casual reading. It means that we need to look at it, read it, try to understand what it's saying. You search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. That's what Jesus said. He said, the words in this book is what testifies of me. So as you go through here and we study the book of Revelation, this is going to testify of Jesus Christ. The word revelation means to reveal. Certainly doesn't mean that it's closed. It means that it is a revealing of the truths of God's Word. It's revealed to you and to me as we study and find out what the Word of God says. So we are told here, and he said to me, do not what? Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. So he's telling us, you know, this book has been given for you to understand, folks. It's not something that's sealed. It's something really that is open that you and I can understand it. True, true, there are sections in it, chapters in it that are hard to understand. We'll take a look at some of those that are hard to understand. But you would expect it to be. I mean, I have to be honest with you. This is not kindergarten stuff. See, it's, it just isn't. It's something that we have to read and understand. This is not the type of program where we're here to entertain you. We're not here. We're here to educate you. That's the purpose of it. And that's what we want to happen here tonight as we go through God's Word, that you read it. And as you read it, we will begin to understand. It also says, blessed is he who reads and those who what? Hear. hear. Not just read it, but blessed is that person who hears. What does that mean? Well, it means you listen. You listen to what it has to say. It's by listening to what it says, folks, is how you gain knowledge. That's how you grow. That's how you gain knowledge is by listening to what it has to say. And as you understand it, it begins to make a great, great difference. I want you to listen to what Paul said about this experience. This is what he said. Philippians 3, verse 8. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellency of the what? Of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord. He said... Give up everything. I'll count it all lost for the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord. 
for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. I'll assure you, if you will take the time, and you'll listen to what it says, and you'll study it, when the Bible refers to it as a pearl of great price, I'll guarantee you it is. Nothing will give you the comfort and the peace that the Word of God gives you. It will help you. So as, we, as we're studying this, listen. Listen to what it says so that your knowledge will be increased. And then it goes on and says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things. It doesn't do me any good if I read it, I listen, and it goes through one ear and out the other. That doesn't do me any good. I've got to be willing to keep what I've learned. That's where it begins to make a difference in your life. You see, if Jesus Christ comes into your life and it doesn't change your lifestyle, then it hasn't done anything for you. It has to change your lifestyle, make a difference. And that's why it says, read it, listen to what it says, but keep what it says. Keep means to acceptance. I accept what it says. It means obedience, that I'm willing to be obedient, to walk as the Lord leads me and guides me in His Word. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. You see, it says it's worthy of all what? Acceptance. In other words, accept it as you understand the Word of God. Reach out in faith and walk in the light of what it has to say. This is what needs to happen. If you love me, what? Do what? Keep my commandments makes it clear. I read the Word of God. He said, if you love me, what you learn, keep it. Keep my commandments. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed, he, blessed is he who what? keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. That's a, a promise that's given. Starts out and says, keep those things you read. And he said, I'm coming quickly, and I'm going to bless those people that keep the words of this prophecy of this book. You and I, particularly today in the time that we're living today, need to be hiding it in our hearts. We need to be listening to the Word of God and keeping it, letting it apply to our lives. So there's a great, great blessing. If you want to know Jesus, then read, listen, and keep those things that are written in the book. You'll find as you read through the Scriptures, uh, many places Jesus says, depart from me. Do you remember what else it says? Depart from me, I know you not. Uh, what I'm trying to say is, why doesn't God know them? You know, here, here are these virgins, five virgins came knocking on the door. So they said, he said, I don't know you. What didn't he know about them? He didn't know who they were because they were not like him in character. And it's so, it's when I read and listen and keep those things that the Holy Spirit works in my life and changes it and makes it different. Okay. The blessings that come from knowing Jesus. This is who we want to know, Jesus Christ what blessings. This next text in the scripture here in the first uh, chapter here, and you may want to underline it, says a couple things that are great, great blessings. Verse 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before the throne. Two words in that text. You ought to underline them, highlight them. Two words, grace and peace. Now, grace is given to me and to you. We don't deserve it. 
in any way. There's no way that we deserve the grace of God. The only reason that we have right to the grace of God is because of our great need. We desperately need the grace of God to come into our lives and change us and to provide for us salvation. It says that you and I have been redeemed by His grace. What does that mean when it says you've been redeemed? What have you been redeemed from? What have you been redeemed from? Do you know? Well, you've been redeemed from death. Don't care who you are, you're going to face it. You're going to die if you don't do something. And so God, in His mercy and His grace, came down here and provided for you a way to live, to have eternal life through His grace. And then it says, peace from Him. Peace. Peace. That Jesus Christ gives. Marvelous, marvelous peace. In a world tonight that is so, so torn up. I mean, in every aspect of life, it seems like everything has gone haywire. We live in a world like I have never seen. Not in my lifetime have I seen the situations that we're in today. But you know, he said, my peace I give unto you. The world can be falling apart all around you, but I can have peace in my heart. But I'm going to tell you a little secret. And don't forget it. Peace is found in Jesus. If you come to Jesus, if you look to Jesus... He'll give you peace in your heart. Charles Spurgeon, a great preacher of the past, said, I looked at Jesus Christ, and the dove of peace flew into my heart. I looked at the dove of peace, and it flew away. Learn. Peace is found in Christ. That's what brings about peace. He gives those great blessings to you and to me. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Marvelous text. In fact, one of my favorites of all the scriptures in the Bible, this is one of my favorite. And it says here, who washed us from our sins in his own blood. I am so, so thankful tonight that that text is not turned around. I'm glad it doesn't say that he washed us from our sins, or it doesn't say that he, how should I put it? It says to him who loved us, I'm glad it doesn't say that he washed us from our sins and then loved us. It says he loves us. And then washes us from our sins. I'm glad God does not love us, you know, like we do one another. It says here, but God demonstrated his own love towards us in while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't say to you, go clean yourself up, get yourself all fixed up, and I run on to people all the time that try to do that today, they say, well, I'm just not quite ready. I've got to take care of some things first. No, that's not the way it works, friend. The way it works is you come to Christ just as you are. God does not love you, or he does not love me like we love babies. Because everybody, anybody, You take a baby who's been bathed and powdered and all, anybody will pick it up and love it. But you let it get a snotty nose and a dirty diaper and watch how many people go the other way. (laughs) See, God does not love us like that. He loves us as sinners, as we are. This is the way he loves us. And he washes us from our sins in his own blood. 
to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, the blood of Jesus Christ. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Dear friend, tonight, if you're burdened with sin, you don't have to be. The blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse you from that sin. And by the way, dear friend, it doesn't make any difference how dark it is. God can cleanse you from that sin. Promises he will. That's hope that he gives us. This text that all of us know says, Come, now let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. All of you understand the comparison between scarlet and snow. But what's the comparison between crimson and wool? What, what is he using there when he does that? Well, as a boy... I had a couple sheep, south down sheep, that's what you're looking at, and uh, I raised them to show in a 4-H club, show, and uh, one day my agriculture teacher said, uh, I'm coming out, we're going to block your sheep. I didn't know what he was talking about, but he came out and he took a couple gunny sacks, do you know what I'm talking about, gunny sack? And he, uh, he cut that gunny sack down one side and one end and then cut off the corner and took that and draped that over that sheep's head, over his head and his body. And he told me, he said, just let him wear that around for a while. Well, I couldn't figure out what was going on because I'd go out to feed that sheep and I'd pick up that gunny sack and it was filthy under there. I mean, dirty and dark and just looked horrible. And I thought, boy, this is certainly not getting it ready for a show. That's for sure. And uh, I don't know how long he wore it, several weeks. Anyhow, one day he came out and said, well, we're going to go take care of your sheep. So we went out there and he took that off and it was just filthy, dirty. And then he took his shears and he began to cut about an inch of that wool off. And it's the purest white you'll ever see. Though your sins are as crimson, they shall be as wool. That's what he's talking about. God does that for you and for me. And he has made us. Folks, these are texts you need to underline, highlight, because they are extremely important. And he has made us Kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. In this text is the very, very essence of Christianity. I mean it all right here in that text. You see, it's simply saying this. Being is not the result of doing. God does not say to you, Act like a child of God and maybe I'll make you one. He doesn't say that. Being is not the result of doing, but doing is the result of being. God says, you are my child, therefore you should act like it. You see, this is the essence of Christian. This is where it differs from all other religions. Makes it totally and completely because God reaches out in his mercy and love and does that for you and makes you his child and gives that to you. I'll give you a classic example of this. You remember after Joseph had sent his brothers back to get their father, to bring them down to Egypt. And it says that they sent wagons down and some 70 of them left the land of Canaan to go over to Egypt. Well, it says when they got on the outskirts, Joseph heard that they were coming, and so it says that he got in his chariot and rode out to meet them. After he had greeted them all, he 
turned to his father and said, I'd like to introduce you to the Pharaoh. So he takes his father to meet the Pharaoh. Now, folks, you've got to understand something. Jacob is a Bedouin. He cares for sheep. He lives in a tent. He's kind of a grimy, greasy old character. Not very clean because you don't herd sheep and live around sheep and stay very clean. Those just don't go together. So he's kind of a dirty, grimy old man. Eh? Can't even see very well. Pharaoh? Pharaoh is the greatest monarch on earth at this time. There is no kingdom as great as the Pharaoh's at this time. Tremendous power, authority, rule. Pharaoh at this time is it. And so, here Joseph takes his old, aged father in before the Pharaoh, and it says, Then Joseph brought in his father Jacob and set him before the Pharaoh, and Jacob, what? Blessed the Pharaoh. How could this be? An old Bedouin, greasy, grimy, blessing the Pharaoh? Because Jacob understood that he was a prince that he was a king under God. Therefore, he could bless anybody. So you are kings and priests unto your God. Dear friend, act like it. You've been called. You're special. God offers that to us, to each one. Now, after the Lord says, listen, I'm going to give you my grace. I'm going to give you my peace. I'm going to make you my children. I'm going to make you kings and priests unto God. After he does all that for you, then he says, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. And that's what verse 7 tells you. Revelation, the first chapter, verse 7, he said, listen, I'm coming back. I'm going to gather my children. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. Boy, underline that text and write it. He's coming. Amen. It's not far away. He's coming back. Amen. And he promises that to you and to me. A great promise that he's coming again. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the what? End, saith the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Now, let me ask you something. Has he been the beginning? Huh? Yes. I mean, say what you want to. But when you go over to Israel, you can't deny that he hasn't been there. Too many things that tell you he has. He is the beginning. If he's the beginning, do you think he'll be the end? Absolutely, he'll be the end. And he gives you the promise he's coming back, the same that he gave to his disciples. Now, when they had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up. The cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which was taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. This same Jesus, the one that we're talking about tonight, the revelation of Jesus Christ, that Jesus is coming back. He's coming back for you and for me. I, verse 9, I, John, both your brother and companion in tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. The island of Patmos, only mentioned in the book of Revelation. It's the only place it's mentioned. This is the island of Patmos. The island of Patmos is about 10 miles long, about 6 miles wide. It is a barren, rocky place. In fact, there are no trees on the island of Patmos. This is a picture of the island, and it's just a barren, rocky place. And they quarried marble here in the marble mines, and John 
at some 90 years of age or close to it, was banished to the island of Patmos. He was on the island of Patmos for 18 months. Without doubt, worked in the, in the quarries there and uh, probably suffered greatly while he was there. Under Domitian, he's the one that sent him there. And after he was released from there, he went back to Ephesus that we're going to be talking about tomorrow night and pastored the church there. And so he lived there and worked. But this was the island of Patmos where John was. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a, me a loud voice as of a trumpet. Uh, I'm just going to quickly say a little bit about this. It says he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Sometimes there's disagreement about what day that is. But if you look at the Scripture, it's quite clear which day it was that John was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Mark 2.28 says, Therefore the Son of Man is also Lord of the what? So it says Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. John was a disciple of Jesus. Okay? Not quite obvious. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. No question about it. It's the Sabbath of the Lord your God. And he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So what do you think John was doing? He certainly was keeping it holy. He was out there communing with God when he had the vision. If you love me, what? Commandments. John loved him. So he was keeping his commandments. I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, and Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. These are the seven churches that he is sending this message to. Okay, now we're going to take a look at Jesus Christ, what it says. A word picture of Jesus in heaven. Watch as it describes him. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He laid in his right hand seven, he had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. I have the keys of Hades and of death. This is Jesus of Revelation. This is him. John here is seeing Jesus. Not like John saw him on earth, folks. He's seeing Jesus now after he's gone back to heaven. This is probably pretty much what Jesus is going to look like when he comes back. Now, true enough, the language here is very uh, figurative, and you have to take much of it into consideration. But this is Jesus walking among the seven golden candlesticks. Please notice, it does not say walking among seven candles. It says candlesticks. You see, candlesticks don't have light. Light has to be placed on them. The candlesticks represent churches. Churches do not have light. Jesus is the light. Somebody else is. 
You are lights. So unless you're there and you're doing what you should, the church has no light. You are the light. I want to ask you something. Does Jesus light up your life? Amen. He should. Definitely should light up your life. Should make a real difference in your life. Well, let's take a look at what it had to say about Jesus. You can underline some of these things. Said his hair was white. Unfortunately, we live in an age that white hair represents declining strength, uh, loss of health. We attribute all that to white hair. Uh, not with God. White hair doesn't represent that. White hair to God represents glory, represents antiquity. It represents power. Yeah, all this is contained, and so when he has white hair, dear friend, that's not because of age. That's because of what God attributes white hair to. In fact, it says here, Proverbs 16, 31, the silver-haired head is a, is a crown of glory if it is found in the way of righteousness. God indeed is righteous, so his white hair represents his glory. That's what it stands for, his power. He, he, the ancient of days, as you hear him described in Daniel, says he had white hair. It's part of it. Also, the eyes of Jesus. In the eyes of Jesus is love, compassion, mercy, kindness. All that's contained in the eyes of Christ. But also, his eyes have the ability to penetrate, to see, to understand what's happening, what's take place, the ability to read your heart and mine. In fact, the scripture says concerning the eyes of Jesus, or the eyes, excuse me, Hebrews 4.13, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. You can't hide anything from Christ. Just impossible, because he sees it all. But at the same time, he's merciful, Amen. he's kind, wonderful. The feet of Jesus. The word here in Scripture where it speaks of the feet of Jesus was as bronze, or brass, I should say. It was as brass. Actually, the word used there for brass described a certain kind of brass that the Greeks and the Romans used. It was a brass, and brass was the most enduring metal they had. And this particular brass was called Corinthian brass. Corinthian brass was made up of bronze, or I should say copper, excuse me, made up of copper and of gold and of silver. And it was considered of more value than gold. And so when it uses that word for Christ's feet there, that's the word that it uses, representing Corinthian brass. Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good tidings. Want to have beautiful feet? Take good tidings to people. That's what he promises to you and to me. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good tidings no. Sound as voice as the sound of many waters. When you pick up the book of Revelation, you start through reading it, you'll find that it speaks of the voice of God being like, you know what it says? Like thunder. It uses that over and over and over. Two things. It says it's like thunder. It says like, it's like the sound of many waters and all. But at the same time, his voice can be majestic. 
but it can be mellow. It can be sweet. It can be kind. God has the ability to speak in a way that will touch your heart and mind. This is what He can do for us. And I heard the voice from heaven like the voice of what? Many waters. And like the sound of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpers playing their harps. So the voice of God speaks. Great power is given. And then stars in his right hand. Stars in his right hand. Stars in the scripture refers to messengers. That's what it represents. And don't forget it. It uses many times stars to represent not only good messengers, but bad ones. It still refers to them as stars. But the seven stars in his hand here, folks, represents the ministers. That's what it represents. Daniel 12, 3, Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. Those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Ministers hold a very, very sacred place in the eyes of God. But they also must realize that they carry a very, very heavy responsibility. God looks after them, cares for them. They are the stars in the hand of Jesus Christ. Sword of the Spirit said, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. The sword represents the Word of God. It says it is a two-edged sword. Nobody who has ever been converted, nobody who's ever been converted hasn't felt the cutting of a two-edged sword. You fall at the foot of the cross and see your sins and all how it can be. But fortunately, he doesn't leave us there because it says, Hosea 6, 1, Come and let us return to the Lord, for he hath what? He hath torn, and he will heal us. He has smitten, and he will bind us up. That's what Christ does for us. Shown like the sun, no greater representation of God, the brightness of the sun, the glory of God. For it is God who commandeth light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is the glory that Christ has. And it says that it is sometimes manifested so bright that they could not look upon it. Write these things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. I told John, write all this, put it down, record it. This is what you and I are going to be looking at, studying the next few evenings together. And it ends up the first chapter of the book of Revelation by saying, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, and the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. And that's where we go next in our study, is to the seven churches. And we're going to look at the first one, Ephesus, and what the Scripture tells us about that church. And so, be sure, if you weren't watching, if you were watching by television or listening on the radio, and you weren't able to get your Bible, be sure, be here. Tomorrow evening, 7 o'clock Central Time, we're going to be taking a look at this next chapter, starting this next chapter, chapter 2, on the seven churches, particularly the church of Ephesus. And we hope that it will bless you in a very, very special way. Thank you for being with us, and we hope you'll continue as we study the book of Revelation. May God abundantly bless you and lead you, and may this study bless your soul and draw you close to Jesus Christ. 
Have a good evening. God bless you. Hello, folks. One of my favorite things to do in the springtime is to take a walk and look at all the new growth. There seems so fresh, and each tree bursts forth with buds and flowers. And that reminds me of a parable that Jesus told his followers in Luke 21. You see, he had just described the events which will happen immediately before his second coming. Great signs in the sun and the moon, the stars, nations in distress because of the roaring seas, and men's hearts failing them with fear as they anticipate what's coming next. But in verse 29, Jesus turns their attention to the fig tree. And ever since then, the budding trees have served as a permanent reminder that our time here is very short and the second coming is very near. Look at the fig tree, all the trees, Jesus says. When they are already budding, you see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Folks, many of these signs are already upon us. The earth groans from the greed of those who have exported her resources, ravaged her land, and destroyed plants and animals and atmosphere alike in a selfish pursuit of wealth. Have you seen the signs? Have you seen men's hearts failing with fear? If you haven't, then I'm afraid you're not watching very closely. However, the Holy Spirit is hard at work, and so are many Christians who long for an end to sin and look forward to their soon coming Savior. And that's why we continue to preach the gospel to as many as we can, through any means that we can, as often as we can. Our ministry team is supported solely by your contributions, and we thank you for your faithful prayers and financial support. May God richly bless you. Please consider what you can do for those who still don't know about Jesus. As the Holy Spirit impresses, please send your tax-deductible gifts to Kenneth Cox Ministries, P.O. Box 1027, Loma Linda, California, 92354. Or call us toll-free at 888-747-1844. Thank you for helping us spread the light of God's Word through television and radio. Your gifts help bring the blessed hope of salvation to millions around the world. The Revelation of Jesus Christ is available on DVD. Each individual program from the first series, Seven Churches of Asia Minor, may be received on a single DVD for only $10 plus shipping and handling. The entire eight-part series including It's Who You Know, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, may be ordered as a set for a total of $59.95 which includes shipping and handling. You may also purchase this series on USB flash drive for the same price. To order, call 1-888-747-1844 or write to Kenneth Cox Ministries, PO Box 1027, Loma Linda, California, 92354. Or you may order online at kennethcoxministries.org. The Revelation of Jesus Christ on DVD. Each message on a single DVD or in a set. It's a great way to share this life-changing message with your family, friends, and neighbors.